evening because I'm in Amsterdam and for you it's probably earlier on the day. Um, so welcome to this session named Should We Seek Consolation? And it seems indeed that we will be addressing that question. Um, so uh, the second speech, I myself will be the first speaker, sounds a bit weird to start with myself, but the second speaker will be, uh, according to my schedule, um, Charles Clanch on the uh, value of liberal education and specifically with an eye on Hermann Hesse's glass bead gain. And then thirdly, um, Jamie Cromarty on a world of wounds on a job and the ecologist. So um, yeah, I'm excited. Um, I'll be chairing the, uh, the session. And yeah, what shall we do? I, we have two hours. So it seems like each of us will talk for say half an hour and then we have some room for conversation before we move on to the next person. Would that be a good format? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and welcome Dan and Chris to, uh, to, to this panel. Um, so I'll, I'll start. <laughs> and my um, talk is called Against, Against Consolation, uh, Simone Biles, Re-Evaluation of Values. I'm finding it more natural. I don't know if, if, if you can recognize that. I'm finding it more natural to read from my paper than from the screen. <laughs> Because otherwise it is, it looks as if I'm looking at you, whereas that's not the case. So if I'm looking at you, I'm really looking at you. And if I'm reading, then I'm reading. It feels more, uh, more authentic for me to do it that way. So um, my contribution to this conference will mainly be a report of a course I taught last January, so a couple of months ago, at Amsterdam University College. And that's a liberal arts and science college in the Netherlands, in, in Amsterdam. The, um, broader name, overall name of the course is Modern Philosophical Texts. And that's a, a broad label to allow for a change of texts after a couple of years. So in the past, the course focused on uh, Spinoza's Ethica, and then on uh, Nietzsche's Das Spoke Zarathustra, and then on Schopenhauer's The Will, uh, The World as Will and Representation. Um, and then, so, so each January, we focus on one book and we read it from cover to cover in four weeks with three hour sessions, four times a week. That's the format. And we call it an intensive course. And that's indeed what it is. And the students are not taking any other courses at the same time, whereas in our longer semesters, they take four courses at the same time. So last year, I decided to move from Schopenhauer to Simone Weil for many reasons. And one of them being that I thought it was about time to learn more about how Simone Weil influenced Iris Murdoch, one of my, well, my favorite novelists, who both in her novels and in her philosophical works was heavily influenced by Simone Weil. Now, of course, a personal reason may be a necessary condition for a teacher to select a book for a course, but it's far from being sufficient. However, there are good reasons, in my view, to dis discuss Simone and Weil, and let me list seven of them before I move on to Weil's readings and specifically to gravity and grace. So here's reason one. Weil's interesting uh, position in continental philosophy uh, philosophizing in the aphoristic style of Pascal and of Nietzsche, one could argue, in a mode that looks existentialist, existentialistic, though it rejects the importance of the will and of choice. The second reason to select her, her focus on the notion of attention and her influence through that notion on, for example, the already mentioned Iris Murdoch, but more recently also on the slow movement in academia, slow philosophy. There's a recent book on slow philosophy and in the concluding chapter, Weil is one of the heroines. A third reason, the strong connection between life and work, between biography and philosophy. Susan Sontag wrote that Weil's person was, excru and I'm quoting, uh, excruciatingly identical with her ideas. And she added that Weil is rightly regarded as one of the most uncro uncompromising and troubling witnesses to the modern travail of the spirit. 
indeed, Miles writings manifest an uncompromising soul. The fourth reason in the list of seven, the sharp distinction between what Miles sees as the supernatural world and the natural world, the world of grace, as she calls it, versus the world of gravity. And in that sense, she offers a Christianized type of Platonism that somewhat, sometimes students see as sort of outdated. But there's this strong, sharp distinction, supernatural versus natural world. A fifth reason, the strong influence of Eastern sources, Hindu and Taoistic writings. And from there, a focus on what she calls self-effacement. This, by the way, connects her to Schopenhauer's ethics, who, based on similar sources, embraces compassion and rejects egoism. A sixth reason is a reason on a different level from the previous points, and in a way, this reason follows from them. Paying attention to Simone Weil would help to diversify our philosophy curriculum, going beyond the existing canon, qua style, gender, and also qua Eastern sources. Finally, seventh reason, there is a fascinating tension between Weil's mysticism and her activism. One would not expect to find these two approaches of mysticism and activism combined in one philosopher. Whereas mysticism presupposes a kind of uh, passivity and receptivity, activism seems to imply an involvement and engagement in political life where the exertion of effort is crucial. So I see this as a seven important reason to select um, Simone Weil as um, a thinker to be discussed in a philosophy class in a liberal arts and science setting. With these seven points in mind, place in continental philosophy, focus on attention, connection between life and work, distinction between supernatural and natural, Eastern sources, the underlying ideal of diversifying, broadening the philosophy curriculum, and finally the tension between mysticism and activism. Let me now move to the text that was discussed at Amsterdam University College earlier this year, uh, Graffiti and Grace, or in uh, French original, La Pesanteur et la Grâce. Now, the choice to focus on this book is somewhat disputable since it was uh, Gustave Thibon who edited the text based on Simone Weil's notes. Weil entrusted her notebooks to Thibon, a farmer and a Christian philosopher, early in 1942. Weil had stayed with the Thibon fa family for a couple of months, working in the grape fields and writing her notebooks. Thibon published parts of these notebooks under the title Gravity and Grace in 1947. Posthumously, since Weil died, died in 1943 at the age of 34, after a life of teaching philosophy, a life of political action, working in factories, doing agricultural labor, having mystical experiences, and after a life of self-exhaustion. Thibon justifies his addition in the introduction to Gravity and Grace, referring to letters from Simone Weil. There's a lot to say about this edition, of course, uh, but let me not do that here and now. As one very last um, introductory note before moving to, uh, before looking into Gravity and Grace, let me quote Thibon, who in his overview of the life and works of Weil in the introduction to the book, at some point says, um, she always used to say everything she thought to everybody and in all circumstances. <laughs> um, I often think of and about this sentence, um, which seems to be indeed a sign of her uncompromising soul. Think of someone who always says everything um, she thinks in all circumstances. Now, what does this text look like and how to go about reading the work? There are 39 short chapters, on average four to five pages. There's no clear structure, although from the start we encounter concepts that keep coming back, such as gravity, grace, energy, necessity, obedience, affliction, self-effacement, imagination, void, 
contradiction, attention, cave, decreation. The style is sober and dense and impersonal in the sense that we hardly find sentences with I, I'm doing this or I'm thinking that. In, in that sense, it's an impersonal tone. As if the self-effacement is already going on in the writing. Now, I think I should share my screen to show you a couple of quotes. Uh, let me see. Can you see this? Is this readable? Should I make it a bit larger? No? Well, this is the first quote you've already had, the saying everything she thought. Uh, that's the Tibon quote from the introduction to GG, Gravity and Grace. So this is the first quote I would like to give you from the book itself. It's taken from the fifth chapter. And that chapter is called um, Imagination, which um, fills the void. It says, imagination is continually at work, filling up all the fissures through which grace might pass. So, filling up the fissures through which grace might pass, referring to one of the key words, grace, and referring to the, the supernatural world that we sort of have to wait for till it reaches us. And it seems that imagination is getting in the way um, of this to happen. Imagination, continually at work, filling up all the fissures. I would say the sentence has um, a structure that is typical for a while. It is a claim, not followed by arguments, not necessarily grounded in reasons, but it is developed at a later stage, repeated in somewhat different words. You could say well, that is a sort of argument, but it's more like repeating the claim and rephrasing it. For example, here, already soon after this earlier quote. The imagination, filler up of the void, is essentially a liar. It does away with the third dimension, for only real objects have three dimensions. Again, this filling up, this time it's filling the void, and that's not a good thing because the void is a sort of stage that we have to go through. And she says, if the imagination is filling up that void, then that is an act of lying, removing the third dimension and in a way removing um, reality. So rephrasing the earlier, um, the earlier quote from the same chapter. Now we can see here that Weil rejects the imagination. And one could be reminded here of Plato's uh, banishment of the artists, because they, according to Plato, the artists, produce and cherish illusions. Indeed, Weil more than once refers to Plato's allegory of the cave with agreement. And she develops a realistic philosophy, a realistic in a philosophical sense like um, a belief in the world outside, independent of our subjective um, thoughts. So she develops a realistic philosophy in which there is no room for, um, especially for self-indulgence. Now, whilst critique of the imagination led to heated debates in the classroom, how to write at all without using the imagination? How to understand Wilde's love of poetry and music given her fierce rejection of the imagination. Here, and we discussed this in class, it would be helpful to differentiate between two types of imagination, a selfish, consoling fantasy and a reality-minded kind of imagination that connects us to the world we are facing and to our co-creatures instead of to our own projections and illusions. In fact, this is a distinction made by Argus Murdoch and arguably a distinction that can already be recognized, recognized in Wilde's text itself. So between fantasy as projecting type of imagination and a more reality oriented type of imagination. Now, 
maybe you noticed that I was just using the phrase consoling fantasy. And that was deliberately to move to the concept of consolation, which is the, um, the topic of our three somewhat related for this reason um, presentations. Let's look a little bit into consolation, at least through um, having a look at one other quote. Uh, this is again from a somewhat early chapter called uh, Detachment. Another important motion, notion, by the way, detachment related to self-effacement. Here, Weil says, and another, you may already recognize the, the tone of the claims and of the sentences. Affliction in itself is not enough for the attainment of total detachment. Unconsoled affliction is necessary. There must be no consolation, no apparent consolation. Ineffable consolation then comes down. Now, some of the important words in, um, in Gravity and Grace can be found here, um, often coined in a somewhat specific way. So affliction, detachment, um, and here consolation. In this chapter on detachment, we find one of the, one of the many contradictions in Wall's work. Um, or paradox, as one could say, because she says here that in order to find consolation, we must stay away from consolation, or we must, we must get rid of consolation, getting rid of consolation in order to find consolation. Um, how to understand this passage? Here we can see, as I would call it, Wilde's re-evaluation of values. Uh, purification of values. Same as with the imagination, there seems to be a good type of consolation and a bad one. The former is selfish, whereas the latter is unselfish and real. Different from Nietzsche, who often said that in his philosophy he was turning around, he was turning Plato upside down. In German he says, meine Philosophie ein umgekehrter Platonismus. I'm just turning around Plato and putting um, things on their feet and putting them back on the earth. Here we can see a movement in a different direction. This is someone who is turning around Nietzsche, going from self-aggrandizement to self-effacement and from a subjectivism to a more objectivistic um, approach. The Intriguing connection with Nietzsche was often discussed in class, especially with a focus on Nietzsche's rejection of compassion or pity. That's, by the way, in itself worth uh, a conversation. The difference, there is a difference, of course, between compassion and pity, and it plays a role in research on Nietzsche's notion of Mitleid, the German uh, concept. Um, but okay, what was my sentence? Um, we focused on Nietzsche's rejection of compassion and pity, a concept that, though not often mentioned by Weil, seems to be central in her thought. And she would more often use the, uh, the notion love, but that should be explained as a form of compassion. So that was another hot topic, um, how to relate things to Nietzsche, uh, a philosopher that uh, students often know better than any other or at least maybe they know they don't know him better, but they read more Nietzsche than uh, other philosophers. When we moved on in the course, we related to some other readings from Weil. We felt invited to do uh, to read more essays, and we especially especially read her draft for a statement of human obligations, a, a political text, I would say. So um, she, there she defends a notion of obligations against a notion of human rights. So draft for a statement of human obligations. And we also read uh, the Iliad, the poem of force. Both are included in a recent anthology of, of her texts. Um, very interesting text where um, she offers an analysis of the notion of force and is um, 
offering a critique of violence. And we also related to a very famous passage from Waiting for God. And I will quote that passage in a couple of minutes. It can be ar argued, and this is, by the way, something that I would like to explore in a, in a research project, that Wilde's notion of obligation, um, I just mentioned this draft for a statement of human obligations, that this notion of obligation may lead to a special branch of duty ethics with attention as highest duty. My intuition is that through the notion of attention as addressed in Gravity and Grace and famously explained in the to be quoted passage from Waiting for God, it will be possible to con connect her contemplative approach with her activism, with attention as the driver of action and with force and violence as something that needs to be rejected. Um, as announced, let me quote a longish passage from Waiting for God, um, one of her other books um, existing of letters to, uh, to friends. Um, we read this text as an extra reading and we kept getting back to it till the end of the course. So we, I think we read it in halfway through the course because there are several um, passages from Gravity and Grace focusing on attention. Um, but here is a longer text related to attention, and I would say very impressive, uh, impressive one. So let me read it and then we can maybe think about it a bit. Um, <clears throat> a sip of water first. Most often, attention is confused with a kind of muscular effort. If one says to one's pupils, now you must pay attention, one sees them contracting their brows, holding their breath, stiffening their muscles. If after two minutes they are asked what they have been paying attention to, they cannot reply. They have been concentrating on nothing. They have not been paying attention they have been contracting their muscles. We often expend this kind of muscular effort on our studies. As it ends by making us tired, we have the impression that we have been working. That is an illusion. Tiredness has nothing to do with work. Work itself is the useful effort, whether it is tiring or not. This kind of muscular effort in work is entirely barren, even if it is made with the best of intentions. Good intentions in such cases are among those that pave the way to hell. Studies conducted in such a way can sometimes succeed academically from the point of view of gaining marks in passing examinations. But that is in spite of the effort and thanks to natural gifts. Moreover, such studies are never of any use. Willpower, the, guy, the kind that, if need be, makes us set our teeth and endure suffering, is the principal weapon of the empress, apprentice I'm sorry, engaged in manual work. But contrary to the usual belief, it has practically no place in study. The intelligence can only be led by desire. For there to be desire, there must be pleasure and joy in the work. The intelligence only grows and bears fruit in joy. The joy of learning is as indispensable in study as breathing is in running. Where it is lacking, there are no real students, but only poor caricatures of apprentices who, at the end of their apprenticeship, will not even have a trade. So. It uh, was quite a, um, an intense text for the students to read, and they talked about it a lot, um, and about doing scholarly work. Um, one of the things to see here that this is indeed, as I said something about that earlier on, this seems to be pretty far away from a more existentialist approach that focuses on will and on choices. And here it seems attention is not 
um, not about an effort. So indeed, if uh, if you as she was a, she she was a high school teacher, um, philosophy teacher at the lycée, and so again, it seems like she was uh, speaking with experience here. And there's an interesting documentary on Simone Weil, where there is an interview with an um, an old lady who was one of Weil's pupils and who could sort of confirm her special style of teaching. So paying attention is not like sitting like this, according to her. Um, so that would not mean anything, uh, according to Weil. So it's not about contracting your muscle, muscles, even if we think that we have worked hard. Um, so it's not about willpower. And by the way, what we see here is that she often, like, in the mystical tradition would say what things are not using the negation of them. It's not this, it's not that. And then at some point you get a sense of what it is. Um, the interesting move I feel is that here we see words such as pleasure and joy, words we do not often find, well, especially not in gravity and grace. It's, it's also, um, but I wouldn't say a dark text, text, but it's very sober. But there are these moments of um, desire, joy, pleasure, and uh, there's some wonderful passages. Also, by the way, on art, saying on art and on nature and the importance of experiences with art and with nature. And here it um, pleads for the joy of learning. Students were impressed by this, and it led to all sorts of conversations on stress, <laughs> on uh, slow, uh, slow thinking, and indeed, this, especially this passage is picked up in the slow uh, movement in academia. Um, and that was, I think, especially impressive since we were with 26 students in a Zoom room, and also the Zoom situation, um, especially since they had so many Zoom meetings and no real contact with other students at some point um, and couldn't travel home. And we have many international students. Um, yeah, I, I think it led to very impressive and intensive conversations about studying and what it means uh, to study. So we connected this to our reading of Gravity and Grace. And I would say um, it is especially this text that gives a clear sense of Weil's plea for unselfish attention, uh, with attention being the highest virtue or highest duty for human being. Now, in the spirit of attention, we as group dedicated ourselves to reading Weil. Uh, students wrote short commentaries on chapters. They focused on salient passages. They unraveled metaphors, they asked questions, so I asked them to ask questions. And then finally, end of the course, they worked together on a guide to gravity and grace. In fact, we are still working on it. And so one student who um, graduated in February is now layouting and formatting in a, in a wonderful, but of course, sober in style, uh, in, in line with uh, Simone Wiles, in a sober layout. And it will be a joy to have this guide as a booklet reminding its participants of um, intense reading hours and attentive Zoom sessions on a text that, in my view, should be considered a core text and maybe I should say even a consoling, but then in the real sense, the consoling core text in philosophy. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my uh, screen. Thank you for your uh, attention indeed. Yeah, I'm not sure if you want to say or ask something or Dan? Yeah, thank you, Maria. It was very interesting. I, uh, I was just, just a clarification question. Um, you said something about the teaching style of Weil um, that was special. Could, can you elaborate a bit on that? What, what, what was special about it or? Yeah. yeah, well, from what I know, she wouldn't follow the curriculum. She would just do her own thing. <laughs> there were books to discuss, there were things to do, but she um, 
um, she would just I think that she did she she would do a lot of Plato um, and she would think out loud she would do a lot of translations she would not necessarily follow the order of things which was could of course also be very annoying um, and with a lot of I, joy then, and yeah, uh, maybe an, anno an annoying for the uh, for the managers of the school. I I don't I don't know, but um, it was it, it was quite impressive from what I could hear from this one old French lady who uh, remembered uh, the lessons very well. And the impressiveness was from from that that uh, uh, improvisation, or was it also from the spirit, or? Yeah, definitely from the spirit, from the way she was dedicated to to the text. Um, yeah, um, she would work immensely hard as um, up to exhaustion. So she was utterly well prepared, and she was. Um, um, I, I think she paid a lot of attention to translating because she thought that translating was important to to get a sense of what some what things really mean. So she would also, and that was not specifically at the lycée, but she would also teach uh, factory workers uh, uh, Plato, even if they felt that they didn't want it. <laughs> she tried to teach them um, those classics. Yeah. Well, thank you. Chris? Um, thanks for that talk. It really uh, whetted my appetite for Gravity and Grace, which I've never read before. Um, and I was wondering uh, if if she makes any suggestions about um, what the sort of positive uh, work that imagination can do is, right? You suggest that there, there seem to be, she seems to have kind of two conceptions of imagination, one that's negative and always getting in the way um, and one that's more oriented towards reality. Um, does she elaborate at all on, on how that type of imagination um, works? How, how does it orient us to reality? Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question because I, um, given her love for poetry, music, and she would recite uh, uh, poems and very fond of literature, it's hardly um, convincing that she would fully reject the imagination. So it's more that say through my reading of Arias Murdoch and getting back to Wilde, so Murdoch was, was influenced and read the notebooks um, already yeah, after the first translation in English became available, so in the uh, late in the 50s. And I could see that at some point it becomes very important for Murdoch to make a distinction between imagination and fantasy. Um, and she explores that, says more about it. And in reading Wilde, some, something I, I started doing later, I think that there are chances to already see that distinction, especially through, uh, well, for example, this quote on consolation, where you say she's not rejecting consolation, she's just rejecting sort of easy way of, yeah, of daydreaming or just not taking things seriously. Um, but I would have to find more, I mean, she doesn't use, she, she doesn't explicitly make a distinction between uh, imagination and imagination to zero or something like that. Um, but to the extent that it can be done, it is through thinking through the contradictions and the par paradoxes and through, through thinking of she's trying to purify all those notions. So it, it, at some point you will reach this a clear-minded type of imagination that is more focused on how things really are. Not that that is an easy thing to say, of course, because of course students would constantly, how does she know how things really are? And that's something that we, we, we constantly had to discuss. Um, yeah. And by the way, in, in Iris Murdoch, there are really, especially in her novels, I would say, uh, wonderful examples of um, 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 persons, often the protagonists, who lose themselves in um, daydreaming illusions and who constantly make the same mistakes. And who then, through seeing a bird or through seeing a work of art, get a sort of change of mind and are seeing things as they really are. And finally know how to 
move on with their lives and how to not make the same mistakes constantly. And I'm seeing that as a sort of imagination close to perception that is that would be in line with uh, Simone Weil. Did your students find consolation in this work in their current circumstances, uh, the circumstances many of us find ourselves in, like we're here now? Uh, did you discuss that with them in class? Was it a component of your teaching? Not necessarily the notion of consolation, um, but well, as I said a little bit related to this um, attention quote and to what it means to study and what it means to study in solitude. Um, so in that sense, it triggered many thoughts on also on the COVID situation. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the, the heated conversations were about imagination and about attention because they that really um, touched them. Um, and well, I left out a couple of things, of course, because we there were many heated debates. So I focused on a, on a couple of notions, but it was surely a, a way for them. Well, maybe I should say that they felt the course to the to the extent that I know these things, because of course they're not telling everything. But it was consoling for them, and it gave sort of structure to their lives to just read this book from cover to cover, which seems to be a let lost a, a, a lot less work than, for example, reading uh, this voluminous uh, The World is Will and Representation. This is not a voluminous book, but it's so dense that they were sort of really structuring their life by reading those sentences, thinking about them, working on an entry for uh, for the guy to file. And I, I felt they need this sort of structure that they indeed pay attention to something throughout the day. <laughs> because so many things were not possible at the time and are still not possible. Thank you. I hope that answers your it does. question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for, for, your, for, for listening and for your remarks. Thank you. I, th I, I think this is, um, and I'm looking forward to that, this is a good moment to um, um, move to you. Uh, to yes, us. thank you, Professor Williamson. Um, I'm speaking from uh, Irving, Texas. Greetings. It's uh, just after lunchtime here. And uh, I wanted to make a couple of points before I start my uh, presentation. Uh, ACTC is one of my favorite conferences. I've been to it more often than I have any other conferences. This is my fifth or sixth in 10 years. And uh, I want to thank ACTC for uh, accepting the proposal. And uh, I want to thank all of you for giving your attention to it. Um, let's see, um, there are a couple of European names in this paper, forgive my barbaric American pronunciation of them. Um, I assume everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and, uh, I have, um, if you see any pets or children emerging onto the screen, uh, please let the tech moderator know because I have no pets or kids and so something is going wrong in the platform. So, um, let's see. Uh, one other thing I suppose, uh, I like to quote somewhat at length to give a sense of uh, Hess's and others, the uh, uh, flavor of their language. And so if you'll bear with me through a couple of block quotations, I, I appreciate it. Let's see. I uh, wrote on the value of liberal education and Hess's glass bead game. Considering the conference theme statement, one of the grand claims uh, advocates of liberal education make is that books, the books we teach can provide consolation and refuge in times of trouble. This paper examines other possible values of liberal, liberal education suggested by the glass bead game by Herman Hesse. One of these possibilities is that liberal education is not simply a source of consolation and refuge, but rather the most valuable thing that must be preserved during troubled times. At the other extreme, another possibility is that liberal education is a frivolity that is of no real value in troubled times. The paper is intended 
to be not merely provocative, but I hope productively provocative. When I read the conference theme, I acknowledged that I had certainly used great books as a consolation and a refuge and well before our present pandemic troubles. And I realized all times are troubled for someone, for countless others who are not within my immediate horizons and for those to whom Pope Francis refers as on the peripheries of life, whether continents away or in our own cities and countryside for whom consolation and refuge might be a meal for the day. I reflected that in my material comfort, I've been struggling for years to make great books more than merely a consolation and refuge, but rather an integral part of my daily life without any success that I can easily articulate. And finally, in considering a proposal for the conference, I thought that one of my favorite books, The Glass Beat Game, might suggest some provocative and helpful ways of thinking about the value of liberal education and the liberal arts. And aside at this point, I don't know many people who have read The Glass Beat Game, even among those people to whom I've recommended it, but I, have, uh, I find it worth revisiting every two or three years at least. I read it for, I think, a fifth time uh, in preparation of this uh, paper. And I highly recommend it to you uh, for uh, in-depth study if you haven't had that opportunity yet. The Glass Bee Game was published in Switzerland in 1943 as Europe was being destroyed by its conquerors and as it turns out, its would-be liberators. He imagined a distant future, several centuries hence, in which intellectuals had helped put the world back together after a devastating age of wars. Beginning with the First World War and judging from the daily use, uh, news, we are evidently in that age now. In this peaceful future, the intellectuals had long before established within each nation a pedagogical province that governs education and provides teachers for the country and shelters an elite that pursues a contemplative, diligent intellectual life for the joy of it. At the pinnacle of the elite and its activities stand the glass bead game players and the game. Quoting Hesse now, the rules, the sign language and grammar of the game constitute a kind of highly developed secret language, drawing upon several sciences and arts, but especially mathematics and music, and capable of expressing and establishing interrelationships between the content and conclusions of nearly all scholarly disciplines. The glass beat game is thus a mode of playing with the total contents and values of our culture. It plays with them as, say, in the great age of the arts, a painter might have played with the colors on his palette. All the insights, noble thoughts, and works of art that the human race has produced in its creative years, all that subsequent periods of scholarly study have reduced to concepts and converted into intellectual property. On all this immense body of intellectual values, the glass bead game player plays like an organist on an organ." End quote. The protagonist, connect, connect. The mass becomes gla master of the glass bead game in Castalia, his pedagogical province. But during his ascent to that high office, he comes to understand that the game is, quote, both the most precious and the most non-utilitarian, the most beloved and the most fragile jewel in our treasury, not only because it is the frailest of our possessions, but also because to laymen, it is undoubtedly the most dispensable aspect of Castalia, end quote. With that introduction, I'll begin with the most critical of my suggestions of the value of liberal education and the liberal arts, that they are of no real value in troubled times. Speaking speculatively, speculatively, of what use would Plato, Aquinas, Thucydides, Bach, Galen, and Dostoevsky be during the aftermath of an asteroid collision or the eruption of a supervolcano, after the meltdown of a nuclear reactor, during and after a hurricane, during a pandemic be severe beyond our present experience, or in migrating populations fleeing flooded coastal zones and areas suffering slow desertification, during an age of wars. Among those on the peripheries of life, whether near to us or beyond our horizons, in relatively stable times and places, liberal education and the liberal arts may clearly be the most beloved jewel of our civilizations, but in troubled times, and all times are troubled times for somebody, they could be dismissed as the most non-utilitarian 
and the most dispensable aspects of a life of mere survival. It does not take much imagination, for me at least, to turn one's gaze from the fanciful apocalyptic catastrophes I mentioned above uh, to today's headlines or to the hungry, cold, and destitute now or in the future. To the degree that I'm always aware of the troubled times of myself or others, liberal education and the liberal arts have been a consolation and refuge, sometimes merely a consolation and refuge that I have used to distract myself rather than to cultivate my own humanity, to turn inward rather than outward. But aside from distraction, during the pandemic, I've also read core texts and other books as a continuation of my frequent reading over the past few years to live with those books, not to the exclusion of a daily life among people and work, nature and community, but as an enrichment of those things and with the reciprocal enrichment of my reading through my other lived experiences. Whether I've been successful is difficult for me to say, but I take heart in the knowledge that teachers and students in liberal education affect the world. Paraphrasing Stringfellow Barr, they make better citizens, friends, spouses, and parents as free people. They are better prepared to live, and when to each his or her hour comes, they will know better how to die. Our colleague at ACTC, uh, Dr. J. Scott Lee makes a powerful argument that the ultimate argument for the liberal arts is that the core texts or pivotal works of the arts and sciences offer to students consideration of what is best and what ways are best to produce what they think is best over and over again. The students will know uh, only that they are free, pardon me, they will only know if they are free if they use their arts to make what has up to the moment not been brought into existence before. Invention in art, including the liberal arts, is not only an inevitable expression of our humanity, it is a maker of our freedom. Liberal arts education is the hope, is the best hope of meeting the challenges that we face, challenges that will require all of the inventiveness we can offer. That's from an excellent book that he wrote last year called Invention, The Art of Liberal Arts. Uh, it's uh, probably available through ACTC, I would imagine it is, and I recommend it as well. Continuing, Dr. Lee's argument adds a dimension to Barr's view in that invention inspired by the materials and methods of liberal education goes beyond the better performance of hum one's human roles. But I note that one aspect of invention includes the crafting of a better human being or the living of a more worthy life, informed by liberal education. For those of us who are faithful in a religious tradition that teaches that God freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life and calls man to seek him, to know him and to love him through all his strength, with all his strength rather, liberal education can be a wide and deep source of raw material for study and reflection, whether or not the works studied are religious in nature. In the intellectual life, Father Sétienge describes the usefulness of casting broad nets, quoting now from the intellectual life. St. Thomas Aquinas took from the heretics and the paganizers of his day an enormous number of thoughts, and none of them did him any harm. An intelligent man finds intelligence everywhere. A fool projects on every wall the shadow of his narrow and inert brow. But do your best to choose but try to secure that all shall be good, wide, attuned to truth, prudent, and progressive." Unquote. My reading of the glass beat games suggests an additional purpose for liberal education, or perhaps an additional aspect of those purposes that I've already mentioned. Connect confides to his colleagues this observation, quoting, critical times are approaching, the omens can be sensed everywhere the world is once again about to shift its center of gravity. Displacements of power in the often, are in the often. They will not take place without war and violence." End quote. Compare that assessment to one from the US intelligence chief uh, last week. Quoting, in the coming year, the United States and its allies will face a diverse array of threats that are playing out amidst the global disruption resulting from COVID-19. Um, and against the backdrop of great power competition, the disruptive effects of ecological degradation and a changing climate, an increasing number of empowered non-state actors, 
and rapidly evolving technology, end quote. Of course, these disruptors are not going to go away uh, after next year. They will not, and they will disrupt the lives in all nations, uh, most brutally the lives of those on the peripheries. In his time, Peck sense a storm, senses a storm coming. We too can sense a storm over our horizon. And in my belief, we are not ready for what is coming. Relying on the great works of our civilizations for consolation and refuge is not enough. We must begin now to address the present troubled times and those to come with all the aspects of liberal arts education discussed here. The formation of free people, invention from the materials and methods of the liberal arts, worship informed by the best of human thought and creativity, and all other aspects of liberal education to transmit, to preserve, and to make the highest possible use of the liberal arts tradition. Connect articulates to his colleagues their duty to save the truth, or rather the striving for truth, in the context of his admonition that they remember that, quote, we ourselves are part of history, that we are a part, that we are the product of growth and are condemned to perish if we lose the capacity for further growth and change. We ourselves, uh, we are ourselves history and share the responsibility for world history and our position in it, end quote. He argues that instead of the glass bead game, teaching is the most valuable jewel in Castalia's treasury. Quoting, teachers are more essential than anything else. Men who can give the youth, uh, the young, the ability to judge and distinguish, who serve them as examples in the honor of truth, obedience to things of the spirit, respect for language. This holds not only for our elite schools, but also for, and primarily for the secular schools on the outside, where burghers and peasants, artisans and soldiers, politicians, military officers and rulers are educated and shaped while they were, are still malleable children. More and more, we must recognize the humble, highly responsible service to the secular schools as the chief and most honorable part of our mission. That is what we must seek to extend, end quote. Knack proposes to leave Castalia to lead an ordinary school, large or small, in the outside country, to help instill our principles into young people out in the world. The glass bead game suggests that in troubled times, advocates of liberal education and the liberal arts should energetically expand their efforts beyond colleges and universities to public and private schools and to public educational efforts, spreading what we have uh, to offer even to the peripheries while living effective inventive lives consonant with the spirit of the liberal tradition. Um, thank you for your attention. I'll entertain questions if you have any or comments. Yes, thank you, Professor Klonsch. I, I was wondering. Oh, that's, I, one I thing I meant, that's one thing I meant to correct. I'm not a faculty member at the University of Dallas. They, they've gotten the okay. idea. I have. I'm, I'm just a very okay. old PhD student. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I had to correct that. That's okay. Um, yeah, it, it feels it feels strange to, to me to say, uh, to say Charles. <laughs> Please. Same as people I don't know, I tend to not use their first names. So oh, well. I, like the, I like the idea of calling you Professor Clonch. <laughs> All right. But, um, but thank you. That. But thank you. Thank you for your talk, and and thank you for um, finally um, inspiring me to uh, to to read um, the, the Hess's last last book. Yes. I start. I started. I started doing it yesterday on a walk, listening to an audio book, and um, I even recognized one of the quotes. But I, I will. But I'm, yeah, it's a it's a twenty twenty one hours uh, audio book, yes. and I I, uh, I listened for I listened for two hours, so and and <clears throat> enjoyed it. Um, so that's not so far. But I was wondering, maybe a little bit um, related to Dan's question earlier. This teacher, so so jo so Knecht, Joseph Knecht is his name. So at some point yes. he is he is going away from uh, yes. Castalia. And, and do you, as reader, learn something about the way he teaches and what he does and, uh, um, and how there, he does that? There isn't um, a direct narrative anywhere in the book that I remember of him in the classroom. 
Hmm. Or, in fact, of him conducting himself, composing a glass bead game. Because um, Hesse was, was uh, reluctant to the point of, of uh, opacity about the rules of the game. He, he wanted to leave that to our imagination, I think. Um, but he does relate a great deal of um, the master's relationship with individual people. And in fact, toward the end, without spoiling the ending, he develops a connection with an individual student. And that seems to be the most valuable thing that um, Connect brings to the table. Uh, aside from the larger ideas, his direct connection uh, and ability to be an inspiration to a student uh, is the uh, idea. Now it might be hard over Zoom, right? Although we've all gotten used to talking over this thing over the past year. Um, several liberal arts colleges, my own Dallas and St. John's have gotten used to teaching the, the deep ideas over electronic connections. So uh, perhaps we can work harder at doing that ourselves in our, in our teaching and learning world. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. So this one-to-one -one, um, conversation probably between a teacher and a student or paying attention to the individual student. Um, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Now, I haven't had the experience of teaching over this thing, but I have had the experience of, of a difficult conversation. And I have found it takes an adjustment, but it's not a, an impossible adjustment. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. You're still muted. Thank you, Mr. Kloger. It was, was, was a great, uh, uh, great talk. Thank you. Thank um, you. I was, I was triggered by one thing you said. Um, sorry, I, I don't completely r remember the context, but I, th I think it was Hesse saying that we should, in difficult times, even go beyond our borders of our classroom and, and, and reach out uh, further. I, his, I was... um, his difficulty with Castalia is that it has become <clears throat> insular and uncaring about the world around it. Um, one of the more interesting episodes in the, in the novel is his development with a, a great teacher of an appreciation of history that Castalia has put aside. They've, they've cut themselves off from the world in, a, lar in a, lar a large way, even though they provide teachers to the country of their support. Um, his answer to the problem he identifies for his colleagues in the leadership is to propose to start a school in the outside world, which led me to think that um, a group like ACTC or some other parallel similar group uh, could do for um, the lower schools, the schools before college and university, what ACTC does largely for universities and colleges. Um, but yes, without spoiling anything, he definitely wants to leave his position a position in which most of the elite of Castalia die in harness. And uh, it's a shocking proposition, but he wants to go into uh, the, a country he has not lived in since he was a child and uh, uh, lead, a, lead a school. Yes, so yes, leaving the elite to go uh, work in the field as it were. There, there is a program at, um, St. John's College, that started at St. John's College, and I'm now I'm struggling to remember what it is called. Um, it may come to me. Uh, Jeffrey Comber, who was a tutor when I was there, and Howard Ziderman, who was a student when I was there, uh, had been very instrumental in, in promoting this uh, down to grade school level. Uh, somebody like Scott, who's probably a little, or uh, maybe Michael Dink, from St. John's would, would remember right away what the name of that, uh, but they publish material. And so they work with very brief selections, but the idea is to get students used to the notion of discussion as a, as a means of teaching and learning. Uh, and of, uh, you know, very uh, forthrightly expressing their views on a text, however, small it may be and simple, uh, appropriate to the age of the, of the children involved. Um, 
Touchstones, I think is the correct name. That sounds familiar. Uh, I was going to get in touch with Dr. Lee in any case with my paper and, and uh, with any insight he might have into the uh, problem that I think I've identified. Um, and uh, I realized that um, it may be a utopian proposal in a sense, but everything starts with a single step like Touchstone at St. John's. And um, while it may seem like I have a morbid fascination with negative scenarios from the future, um, uh, I am optimistic that uh, we in the liberal arts can do something. Um, it, I was reminded of a joke. I, I initially thought to mention the possibility of a zombie apocalypse, but I didn't want to become too, too uh, uh, referential to the popular culture, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. There's a joke, at least in America, that if you're being chased by a bear, you don't have to run, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the other person. Um, and I was thinking that in the case of uh, being chased by a zombie in a zombie apocalypse, you don't have to outrun the zombie, you have to outrun the liberal arts expert carrying all the heavy book. Um, I don't know if that's funny or not, but you know, that's my contribution to humor at ACTC. Um, I would like to uh, think that a, a broad and deep effort over the next few decades is possible to confront what we're facing all around the world, recognized by pragmatic people in governments and by uh, scholars. Um, but I uh, know that things have to start small and uh, I'm willing to devote much of the rest of uh, my professional life to uh, working on that. Yeah. So I say it. Sorry. The mother raiser has. Thank you very much. <laughs> has just said that the St. John's program for high school students is called Summer Academy, and she posted a link okay. in the chat. You can have a look. Thank you. Thank um, you. By the way, may I also say that? Um, yeah. Sorry if this sounds very uh, making commercial, but I, I would really um, appreciate it. So tomorrow we're hosting a, a, a session about an initiative just like this. Um, in oh, no, sorry, it's on Friday. Um, on Friday in the morning. So it's called. Um, now I forget the, the title. <laughs> What's well, oh yeah, know thyself. Developing a teacher training course um, around freedom and quarantine, which is a uh, so oh. I together with a, 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 um, a, um, I've, I've translated a book by a philosopher, which I think could be a basis for a liberal arts course. Uh, and we're kind of doing that as an outreach project together with some friends and colleagues. Um, and and we're, we're trying to kind of get a discussion around, it's a very nascent, uh, it's just being born the project, so it's very recent. Um, so we're, we're hoping to have a nice discussion. So if any of you would be interested to join, we'd be really appreciate it. Yeah. I will tune into that, thank you. Um, yeah. Mr. Edelman, uh, Professor Edelman, did yeah. you have a question earlier that I... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. Um, thanks, thanks for the paper. It's it's nice how uh, it seems to me at least that these first two papers complement each other very well. And so this is actually a question both for you and for Marietta, perhaps um, about consolation and the relationship between consolation and and action. So it seems um, uh, connect uh, derive some sort of consolation from the liberal arts, right? And has moved to, to go out into the world. Um, and similarly, there's this connection in, in Bay uh, between, or perhaps, right? Uh, mysticism and consolation and the activism on the other hand. And um, certainly they're not necessarily talking about the same sorts of consolation, but that's kind of what my question is. I was wondering um, if uh, each or either of you could, could say something about the um, the potential connection between consolation one derives from study in general, I mean, study the liberal arts um, and activism of some sort. Um, Professor Willemson, I defer to you to go first. That's it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's an immense question um, that sort of keeps haunting me also in, in, in ethics courses, how to go from knowing the virtues to manifesting them or express, acting on your virtues if you have them or 
And of course you can give a whole psychological treatment, but that's not your, and I, I couldn't do that. And that's also, also not your question, but, but yeah, I wouldn't have a clear answer, but it's, it's, I think it's the question, it's the question how to, um, well, I'm thinking of, for example, um, a lot of work written by, by Marta Nussbaum on how novels can help judges to make better judgments because they, have sort of lived more than others. <laughs> you can never live enough, she says at some point. But you could still wonder, I mean, it's not necessarily the case that reading a good novel makes you a better human being. And I think that that's indeed your question. I, and I wouldn't have an easy, or maybe not even a, an answer at all. I wouldn't have an easy answer. I think it's one of the most deep questions. How do we get from, well, in, in Wilde's terms, but, and that maybe helps a little bit, she would say, she, she would again point to the notion of attention. And she would say, you will have to pay attention up to the point that you no longer have a choice. And she would, well, that's a platonic insight. And I'm not sure if I agree, but I'm in any case finding it impressive that she says, um, having a clear vision sort of moves you to doing it. So it's a matter of paying attention and then you're sort of forced by your own attention to act on it. Can I just ask a quick follow-up there about the concept yeah. of purveying? Um, whether it, is it uh, less a sort of positive experience of, of comfort and more uh, a kind of unselfing Definitely, definitely. Sorry, it's, yeah. Okay. Definitely, yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. It, it, it's especially because of this reason that she would be skeptical about comfort, and um, she would, well, if 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 there is a choice at all, which she would deny, then she would always go for the uh, for the most difficult thing. She would so that's that's, and not for the comfort, um, yeah. So maybe that's already, so the suffering and affliction are really prominent. Maybe that's already a, a bridge to the, to the next contribution <laughs> by, uh, by Jamie Cromarty. But maybe there are, are more uh, remarks. Um, I wanted to comment on that, on that question. Yeah. It's interesting to me, being somewhat acquainted with the writings of early Quakers, that they were not in, by any stretch of the imagination, educated in liberal arts. Um, they knew the Bible in its um, English translation very, very well, um, remarkably well, but they were not driven by, they were not in that sense, you know, well-schooled. And although many of them were practical people, some of them were from the upper classes and would have known probably a certain amount of Latin, Greek, and that sort of thing. Um, but nothing like what we think of as the liberal arts today. And yet, there was a very powerful impulse out of their essentially mystical uh, religion, which, which allows for direct uh, listening to the voice of God within and acting in the outer world. And in the sense of always bending their will to what they thought was the was the will of God. Um, now that doesn't match very well with Quakers of the 19th century who became what they call quietist and who really withdrew from active participation in many aspects of society, although there were, of course, among them people who were leading the struggle for women's rights and, and against slavery and that sort of thing. But but that would be a place to look, I think, for an understanding of, of the connection between mysticism and action, but it wouldn't help you as far as, the, as far as the liberal arts go, although they were great proponents of education. Um, although I tend to think the heyday of Quaker education, the pinnacle of Quaker education tends to not, if anything, it seems to, to break the connection between those, between those two things, if you, if you know what I, what I'm driving at. 
Um, so I don't have a good answer to that, but I think it, that's a really good question that, that, you know, action in the world and this kind of, of mystical shedding of oneself uh, seems to be, seems to be a very difficult thing to understand. Thank you. That's, uh, that's really <clears throat> helpful. That's very helpful. And they wrote a lot. They, they wrote <laughs> pamphlets and just endless accounts of their, of their lives, some of which are quite fascinating. So it's, it's an interesting thing at the source. Uh, okay. Thank you. I, uh, Professor Edelman, I have very little to add in, in answering your question to uh, what we've already heard, um, except to say that I think that connect motion uh, from being a young student of Castalia to being a leader of Castalia. And finally, his, his proposal to leave, to go teach, uh, is a turning from, a, from um, a useless inwardness of the liberal arts done, or, or for education or for intellection done simply for its own sake, to um, uh, a turning outward to preparing other people um, for the times of hardship that he described and just for, for life in general. Um, I think there's a lesson there for us. I'm not saying that anyone here or anybody that I have known recently at Dallas uh, has turned inward away from the world, but um, I went to a college which referred uh, to life at the college as behind the hedges because uh, we tended to hide uh, behind uh, this hedge that, that surrounded our 300 acre campus and we didn't have much to do with the world. Um, I know that liberal arts colleges send teachers out, uh, both to private and charter and, and public schools. Um, I'm suggesting a deeper, broader engagement, uh, crafting curricula and even starting schools or advising the starting schools uh, in the world, in not only the United States, but other countries as well. Um, I think that Dr. Lee's um, idea that invention is the ultimate argument for the liberal arts, that we can be taught to invent using the raw materials of the liberal arts is best thought of as an outward turn, an outward turning, uh, a giving to the world. Um, and if I harped on the peripheries, maybe uh, uh, without framing it properly, this paper is a, is a, a window into my recent reading. And for various reasons, religious, political, and academic, uh, I've become aware that much of what I'm familiar with and concerns me on a daily basis does not begin to give uh, proper due to the people in our society who do not have uh, my advantages. Um, uh, you may have heard that Texas went through this incredible power outage that lasted a week and everybody was freezing back in February, very unusual circumstance. Uh, the news covered it broadly, but did not cover adequately how people who were always on the edges suffered even more. They concentrated on middle class and upper middle class and rich people's concerns about having their heating off for three hours at a time and 30 degree weather. Um, so I, I think that the liberal arts have something to offer everyone. And that probably involves political activism, uh, a religious, religious ministries that turn outward rather than inward, uh, and academic endeavors that turn outward rather than inward. So. Thank you very, thank you very much again for, for your lecture and for your, yeah, additional. Thank you for um, your attention. Yeah, and additional uh, words. Um, let me give the floor, well, the Zoom floor to uh, Professor Cromarty for his uh, contribution of World of Wounds on um, Job and the ecologist. That's the full title, if I'm correct. Um, That's right. Yeah. Um, I will read this. It is brief, and then I think we'll have time, and I can try to answer some questions. I am, I am condensing a good bit of uh, the, some of the things I, I thought about these readings. The readings, by the way, are the Book of Job, a new translation with in-depth commentary by Robert D. Sachs. Uh, a few of you who were in Santa Fe a couple of years ago may have gone to Robert's talk. Um, and then Aldo Leopold, a Sand County Almanac 
and essays on conservation from Round River. Um, the contrast between Job's three friends' understanding of his suffering and his own sense of injustice is central to the story of Job. The friends connect what has happened to the received wisdom, the, the friends connect what has happened to the received wisdom of the tradition, which assures them that a good man cannot be made to suffer unjustly. Job is convinced that he has done no wrong. He has begun to see a world that is quite likely to inflict misery and loss, even on those who have done nothing wrong by the traditional standard, and even on those whose conduct has been exemplary. He begins to think that for his suffering to make any kind of sense, he has to exile himself beyond the boundaries set by the tradition of orderly civilized human life. Beyond lies a wild place, the place of the jackal or the shadow of death. Now the fourth speaker, Elihu, urges him not to venture there because no human can face the raw power of God. Job must simply submit and hide himself from such terrors. Still, Job insists he wants to know what it is he has failed to grasp. Job gets his answer from the voice out of the whirlwind. The marvelous chapters 38 to 41 lay before him the sublime beauty and terror of the world before and beyond the human. Central to this wonder is the revelation that God caused all this to come to be by allowing things to develop according to their own generating, birthing, and nurturing principles. Sachs points out that while there is some reference to God making and measuring out boundaries, there is much more emphasis on things developing by their own internal causes. He says that here we get the idea of nature working autonomously, giving birth to a vast range of beings that do not conform to man's needs or sense of what is right, but exist free and for their own ends. Some are untamed versions of domestic animals like asses and oxen. Some are wild and fierce even when used by man like the war horse. Some appear to be laughably foolish like the ostrich. And some, behemoth and leviathan, are simply beyond human power. What is revealed by the voice is a world beyond the human, one that man can never tame and whose sublimity means it would be unjust to do so, even if it were possible. In this, Sachs argues for the sacred character of wild nature. We can and must learn from it, but we can't control it. The poet of Job is the quintessential ecologist. Sachs makes another point here. Leviathan, king over all the sons of pride, although utterly awe-inspiring, is closed up in his impenetrable armor. Nothing gets through to him. He rules this realm by the sheer weight of his power. Job is the opposite. He is open and can see and absorb the wonder of the natural. By being open to beauty and terror, Job comes to understand both the other and himself. He can operate in his human realm through love and understanding. In the end then, Job returns to the human world where he helps his friends atone for their ignorant advice. He is able to receive condolences for the loss of his children and his suffering, and he can rebuild his fortune. Sachs ends by pointing out that Job's acceptance of the importance of the birthing and nurturing power of the womb expressed in many of the images from chapters 38 to 40, produces a change in how he treats his daughter. He gives the three an inheritance alongside his sons, in contrast to the prevailing custom that daughters get only dowry. This, I think, is an example of what Sachs means by saying that the voice from the whirlwind has revealed to Job a realm that operates by laws unlike the received human tradition. And Job must remember those lessons as he rebuilds his life in the human world. I like his observation that Job has become aware of a realm in which he is utterly insignificant, which, however, contains possibilities for love and laughter that can inform the world in which Job matters very much. Although Leopold says in his essay, Round River, 
One of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on land is quite invisible to layman. So I previously just compared Job's comforters, understandings, and Job's understandings of God's creation. Their conventional wisdom cannot satisfy Job, who has directly experienced disaster that he is certain cannot be punishment for any transgressions on his part. Misfortune has pushed Job beyond the boundaries of human society into the place of the jackal, where the voice from the whirlwind opens his eyes. Job sees that the world which God created works, which God created works in ways that defy his and his friend's concept of right and wrong. Although Leopold was also forced to give up the comfortable sense, humans know what is right in the natural world and that all is manageable for human benefit. Leopold began his career as an ardent proposal of controlling wildlife for what he viewed as human interest, but also with an openness to deeper experiences of wild things. His revelation came on a mountain far from human society. As he describes it, the fading of the fierce green fire in the eyes of a dying she-wolf revealed that his understanding had been too simple. And now I quote Leopold from the essay, Thinking Like a Mountain. We, re we reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger hitch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. In thinking like a mountain, he acknowledges that although he once sought to exterminate them, he came to recognize that wolves, mountain lions, and grizzly bears, like Behemoth and Leviathan and Job, have a place in the world. Unlike the Job of, the, of his story's ending, Leopold is not able to recover what he has lost. On the other hand, his suffering is neither so physical nor so personal. Instead, suffering comes from a growing recognition that the world's wealth of ecological communities is being lost to human progress. In the essay on cutting down an old dead oak tree for firewood, he uses the saw's progress through the annual rings of the tree to recount all that has been destroyed over the century and more since the tree first grew. It's a history of extirpation of many species, of vast changes in the landscape, and of a few uncertain steps to save some of the remainder. Like Job, Leopold wants to rebuild our human life on a new foundation of knowledge. The way the world works is deeply counter to our conventional wisdom. He makes this especially clear in his essay, The Land Ethic, where he calls for a new standard for judging our actions in relation to the ecological community. In the Old Testament, the voice out of the whirlwind commands Job to consider Behemoth, whom I made as I made you. Behemoth and the other beasts described in that passage are as much a part of the world as Job and his friends. As he came to understand ecology, Leopold was similarly convinced that we are not a separate privileged species above the rest of the ecological community, but ordinary members and citizens of it. In other words, we are all in this together. Like all living things, we must live by exploiting other lives, at least to some extent. Unlike others, we can ask ourselves whether there are limits to exploiting the natural community beyond which we will be less just and less happy as a human community. Leopold cannot say for certain what those limits should be, though we can see plenty of examples of wanton and careless destruction that we do too little to prevent. What he feels sure of is that we ought to preserve at least some of all the components that make up the ecological community and that we ought to regard ourselves as part of it, not its masters. The book of Job wraps up the story neatly, and I would say a bit too neatly, in the end. Is that because as some think the redacted version has been made to fit into a conventional framework of religious piety, however bizarre that seems to make God's actions. 
In any case, Leopold can have no such replacements for his losses because they are not his alone, and it will take generations to stop the losses and begin to recover. For instance, in the 1970s, the United States passed the Endangered Species Act, on paper one of our strongest environmental laws. Implementing it, however, has been an uphill battle against both lack of scientific understanding and determined resistance by those who must forego immediate gain. Even as we make incremental progress, habitat destruction, climate change, and pollution are endangering ever more species. The sentiment expressed in Round River is as true today as when Leopold wrote, to learn ecology is to come to realize how extensive the world's wounds are. Let us hope they can be healed. And that's my end. And so at this point, we should talk a little bit about you know, what I left unsaid or, or said wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We would like to open the conversation. And Job. I really, really like this connection that you're making between uh, the book of Job and, and Leopold. Um, that, so the, the, uh, the book on Job to which you were referring, can you remind me of, of, of the title and author of that? You can see if the screen can pull it up. It's, it's um, yeah, see we're having trouble with the Not camera because of the background. I can take the background away and it'll, it'll work better, but it's called the book of Job. And it's, it's a new translation with in-depth commentary by Robert D. Sachs, uh, published by Kafir, K-A-F-I-R, Y-A-R-O-Q, books. And they're a branch of the Green Lion Press, which in the, in the day used to be represented at the physical ACT meeting. Um, they're out of St. John's College in, in Annapolis. Yeah, that's the one. Now, your version looks very different than mine. I think okay. that's earlier. I think that's an Pretty earlier old. different publisher. And this is the this is the reprint. Now, here it comes. I can sneak it in. Yes, this is from 2005. So, yes. So that, there it is. So it seems to be an eco-critical reading of the book of uh, Job. I would not, I would not <laughs> blame Mr. Sachs for that. That's entirely my, <laughs> that's entirely okay. my responsibility. I just I wanted to, to I had, then I can compliment you instead of blaming someone. <laughs> I wasn't going to blame anyone. <laughs> well, I just want to say that I don't have his stamp of approval and he is by far, far a finer, scholar of the Old Testament than I could ever aspire to be. Um, and so there are many more aspects to this and his extensive commentary. But as an ecologist, reading this, I've always been fascinated by the book of Job. And I think it is really because of those chapters 38 to 41, where the voice out of the whirlwind describes this amazing world. Uh, it, that's just unforgettable, whether you read it in his translation or in the King James version or whatever version. It's, it's such a powerful bit of poetry. Um, and so I've always been fascinated by that. But, but his reading opened my understanding in, in a way of, of the text and of, and of the interplay between the, the consolation that's offered to him and his reasons for rejecting it. And at the same time, why it is that God speaks to him and says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Because Job's eyes really aren't open to this until that moment when he sees in some sense, what every ecologist would tell you, which is the world doesn't work by our rules, you know, and you can't expect it to. And that's, that's what we call the, the law of unintended consequences. Well, 
yeah, that's right. You know, in a certain sense, um, the, the things develop according to their own nature. And the question of intention is really beside the point. You know, they do what they do. And we, we have to find a way as humans to live with that, with that reality in some sense. Um, and it, it, it's, um, it's not an argument for rejecting the human world. And, and certainly Job doesn't do that. He, he returns to it and in fact, tries to live in it in a way that's better than the way he was, even better than the way he was living before. At least that seems to me what Sachs is telling us. But as you can are you, see- Are you optimistic? Oh, am I? Um, yes. Or does this, I, do I these works say, console you in your, in your say, lack of optimism perhaps? I, I would say <laughs> it depends on how you define it. It's a lot more, you know, it's a lot more difficult to destroy a world than you might think. You can, the loss, the loss in many ways will be will be ours if if we make a mess of things. But to say that that we'll somehow destroy it is simply not the case. It doesn't work. You can't. You could try. You can't destroy it. I don't think. Now, Job had no idea, or the poet of Job had no idea of the power that could sweep aside the behemoths and the leviathans of the world and sort of take over the space they occupied for humanity. But I don't think it changes the fundamental, the fundamental insight. I see, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, so a concept that I always find very fascinating is the concept of mystery uh, in the sense that it's something that that you um so on the one hand never get to know fully but on the other hand should always advance in the knowledge of in order to enrich and to improve um so i i think that the experience of job is really the one uh, experience of, of facing mystery right it's um so yeah i don't know where the where this is where this is going but <laughs> But it seems that the, in this facing mystery, um, well, it's hard. Yeah, this evaluation you make of you know is it is it hard or is it not hard to to destroy things? Yeah, maybe it's just beyond us. Or I mean, we can try to understand further, but but uh, I don't know. I haven't I haven't fully deeper developed ways, the deeper ways in which the world works would be very hard to change. You know. Yeah, and in in that sense, um, the notion of destroying life on Earth betrays a sort of an ignorance as to what the nature of life on Earth actually is, because we see it. And I, I mean, I struggled with this for decades trying to teach students basic ecology. Mm -hmm. To them, you know, the world of of bipedal, six foot high creatures and their pets and other animals is that's the world you know and to try to explain to them that that's not what we're talking about um, or at least that that what you're seeing is only part or a facade or a, a very very limited view of what the world is so, so may i ask so you you taught ecology or yes. what what okay can, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? It's so interesting. Well, I was at St. John's mm -hmm. at college, and I went to Cornell University and got a PhD in ecology. Um, and I went and taught at Stockton University. I did not spend a lot of time doing a lot of research. I never completely took my hand out of the game, but I, I, I did that. And I, I always tried to balance my programmatic teaching, which was primarily ecology and uh, certain specialized other courses, uh, and um, what we call general studies at, at uh, Stockton, 
in which I, I went back to the core text approach and particularly to the St. John seminar approach. And I, I was rather uncompromising in my approach. And I think it was always an uphill struggle with the students at Stockton who were uncomfortable in that setting, very uncomfortable in that setting. Being asked to say what they thought about a text was almost terrifying to them. So, so may I ask how you, you taught great texts as e ecologists? So what I sort of texts? As an ecologist, but I taught okay. uh, two courses. Yeah. Uh, to one to seniors and one to freshmen. These are only the most recent ones. I, I tried many different variations on this. But um, in the end, I was teaching a course called, um, called Green Politics, which was primarily political philosophers, but ending with a good bit of, of well, things like Darwin um, and then some modern texts that we also used in our environmental issues course, which depicted the environmental crisis and looked at it in political terms and what it, what it meant. So we read a variety of things there. Um, but, we, but I tried to give them a grounding with some very basic political texts. So um, we actually read Republic first, which for seniors, you would think there would be some hope, but they had a very hard time. They liked Lao Tzu a lot better than we read, we read the Tao Te Ching. They liked that a lot better than Plato. Uh, Thank you. We read Hobbes and Locke and the US Constitution and, and that sort of thing in a number yeah. of times. But Darwin, uh, it was a strange, but interesting fun for me to do it. But I think, as I said, the students showed a lot of it. My other one was called the Biosphere and it was more specifically biological in content, but it did try to follow the St. John's approach in going back to core core science text rather than never used the text. May I, may I just share some some of the thoughts you're triggering me? Uh, yeah. uh, Mr. <laughs> because um, I'm a biologist myself. I'm a theoretical biologist. Uh, so we, <laughs> and I share an interest in, in religious books as well. So I think we're, <laughs> we're pretty close. <laughs> but uh, um, so to me, I mean, the, the, the question is what, you, what you're saying, the triggers in me is, um, so I, I'm a modeler and I've always, um, you know, I've, I haven't studied climate very extensively. I've studied it a bit. Um, and I've always been impressed by the complexity of the models that are being used, right? So you have, um, you have all these feedback loops at different time scales and they all come together. And, and in the end, you have chaos theory, which tells you that, uh, if you have such, such very complex systems, then you may change something very small and it, the whole outcome changes. Um, on the other hand, it also tells you that there are some systems that are incredibly stable that you can, you know, bang against as much as you want and it, they don't fall over. Um, and for me, looking at these systems uh, has always been a bit of a job experience, I suppose, <laughs> of, of kind of being humbled, you know, thinking, wow, this is so incredibly complicated. Um, how... I can even start to begin to form a judgment about, about these issues. Um, at the same time, I, I recognize what you say is that, um, so reality is even beyond those models, right? Mo the models already have a lot of complexity in them, but, but reality, but they're, they're all, so on the one hand, they really refer to reality. I think we have to say that because they don't, they capture at least important aspects of it because else they wouldn't predict those things as much. But at the same time, they also go beyond it. And for me, um, that, that relate, I mean, th this is the kind of the problem that, that your talk triggers in me, which I don't have an, an answer to. Um, but I just, I thought I'd share with you for in, in case you have any insights. Well, I think that's very much Leopold's view too, is that it's unlikely that we'll ever completely understand. And so he steps back and says, but it certainly seems to us that we have an obligation to save all the parts yeah. as best we can. At least we can do that much to try yeah. to hold to try to hold the things together. Yeah, and absolutely. it's almost more of an ethical than a practical claim. Hmm. And looked at from a sort of purely Darwinian point of view, 
you could argue whether that really matters or not. Since most of the species that have ever existed are now extinct, why are we being so worried about a few more? Uh, yeah. Other people have other ways of responding to that. But, uh, and I tend to think about it in terms of, of um, well, he has a great line in one of the books about we're remodeling the Alhambra with a bulldozer. I, yeah. And we might really want to stop and think about whether that's a good idea. Well, I, I can good remember idea. saying that in a discussion of climate change many years ago. Why on earth do you think that you can just dump into the atmosphere a huge amount of a highly um, physically active substance and then say, well, we don't really know if anything's going to happen. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, something doesn't happen. make sense to me. I especially like the, the why on earth becomes more and more of an urgent phrase to say why on earth. Okay, and, and sorry. Let me tell you, if you ever really look at the, I mean, the, the kind of thing that ecologists begin to realize, such as the extent to which our domesticated animals outweigh all the other creatures that live on earth. I mean, it, it's, it's not even proportionate. It's, it's insane. Cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, and on and on and on like that. Make a pile over here. It's huge. Now take all the wildlife, the birds, the snakes, the toads, the frogs, everything but the insects. Put them in a pile. It's so tiny. And you're like, what? Nobody, and I don't think any of my students think of the world that way. They think there's wild animals out there galore. It's not true. <laughs> and, and you have to think about those kinds of things, but it's, it's just, it's distressing how much we've remodeled the world in our, in our, on the one hand, there's probably more sheer weight of those kinds of animals on the planet than there ever was, but they're all cows and pigs and sheep and goats and chickens. And on the other hand, there's a lot fewer of the lions, tigers, the wild animals, the, the crocodiles and the hippopotamuses that I tend to identify with behemoth and leviathan. Just, and then a lot of human beings. In and addition there's a lot to. of human beings. <laughs> and, 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 and Chris. As much compared to our domestic animals. Okay. Chris? Chris. Um, I'm, I'm struck by, in thinking about Leopold, um, by how uh, it seems that, how important imagination, <clears throat> excuse me, seems to have been in his own um, evolution. You know, you, you tell the story about him and, and the wolf. I've not read uh, Thinking Like a Mountain. That's where he recounts his experience with the wolf. Um, and of course, it's this act of imagination to see, to see the, 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 what is it, the, the green fire die, right, in, in the eyes of the wolf. And then in and uh, the land ethic, um, you know, starting with talking about uh, Odysseus and and thinking to describe the land as this this fountain of energy, right, um, flowing through this circuit. Uh, it just seems like um, this may this may be a, a connection back to the the value of the liberal arts and the way the liberal arts kind of um, stock our imagination. Um, and help us to practice uh, the, the making of, of metaphors, right? And, and yeah. the interpretation of the natural world um, in these figurative ways that has the power to really kind of move us in a way that, that the facts themselves don't. Um, and it, you know, it makes me think back to, to Veil and, and her comment about the imagination getting in the way of grace, um, whereas it seems, um, Imagine that grace comes to Leopold in a way uh, via his imagination. And, and through beauty, I think, is the other really important element in that. And the idea that, that what is good and right and what is beautiful are not always, but generally very similar. And there's, I think that that image of the fierce green fire is something that's just, you know, uh, and, and I think today we would not, we would not be taken, we, we would be 
we would consider the the wolf and her pups playing in the in the stream bed a beautiful sight. At, at Leopold, as a young man, only thought, you know, fewer wolves mean more deer, so let's start getting rid of them. And that's why the wolf dies in a fusillade of bullets, because, you know, getting rid of predators is somehow our, our, in our best interest. And yet then that experience of this fading, the, the, this both beautiful and, and, you know, but it's terrifying and sad to see the light fade, the fire fade out. And, and it obviously affected him very, very deeply. And he, he really changed his attitude towards the management of, of land and that sort of thing by, by the, that after that event, and, and it had a big impact. And I've known people who spend a lot of time in, the, in those situations. Some, some of them come around, some of them um, are awakened to the beauty and start to say, this isn't right. I, you know, I, I've got to change this. I can't keep doing this. Uh, unfortunately, others don't. <laughs> I was just so pleased, and I didn't say it at the time because I didn't want to. I didn't want to get off into my subject. But I was just so fascinated to see the connection that I perceived between um, Wild and and this um, kind of view. And I, I'm trying to understand what something makes Wild a little bit different. Like I. I, I really had the feeling that that you know she wants to be there in the in the in the in the grit you know in the somewhere uh, with the industrial workers or that kind of thing, and, yeah. and not, not the yeah. kind of person who would who would find consolation in nature. Yeah, well, I I find consolation. In, I'm, although I'm not sure she does entirely. She was a great no, professor of Saint Francis. Yeah, they're they're now sort of. Environmental studies type of using parts of wild to uh, um, and, and phrases of her on nature. So there are connections there, and by the way, also interesting connections between wild and and Job in the sense that, well, difficult chapter in her uh, in in her uh, biography is that she had great difficulties with uh, the Old Testament. Um, so the, sort of the anti-Judaism of uh, an ass assimilated Jew, um, with the exception of the Book of Job, where she was uh, very impressed by the Book of Job, and uh, well, I would say through the suffering and, and a sort of deeper type of consolation. I've, um, I've known a number of philosophers who who did not care for the Old Testament at all. Yeah, some of them liked Genesis a little bit, the very beginning, opening chapter. Yeah. Now, for her, it was only the Book of Job and 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 the Psalms, the Psalms. That would be uh, the exception. Yeah, right. but okay, that's, that's maybe a. No, but that seems to be a, a not unusual attitude. I, I think, mm. so. because the. Well, actually, Sachs's translation and commentary on the on the Book of Genesis is really interesting, but I don't think it did anything to disabuse me of the idea that mm. it's a very, it's a very different text, with a very mm. different outlook. Then, yeah, but then it's interesting. To see, it's interesting to see connections between uh, the three of us, and also through the questions by Dan and Chris. Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing more connections. Um, makes me think of, uh, yeah, of also Biles' um, explanation of beauty and um, what she says about nature. Um, so, and I'm curious to to learn more about. Uh, Sachs' uh, introduction and explanation of the Book of Job sounds uh, really interesting. I think we should maybe round off our conversation. Um, I'd like to thank all of us <laughs> for being in this room and having such a such a good conversation. For me, it's by the way the very first thing I'm I'm hearing at uh, this conference. I, I hope to hear more tomorrow and Friday. So, um, and for me, it's also the very first experience um, at an ACTC conference. Uh, all so all I'm very, I can say with respect just, to that is, if you ever get a chance to actually physically be present, it, I will. I will do my best to do that. It's, um, it's a great, great first experience. Out. I, 
I was such an isolated academic and I, I always feel bad that I could never drag more than one or two of my colleagues into even a temporary interest in this. Fortunately, there was one. But um, I met people I never would have known. And, and particularly from the um, Catholic institutions. I don't know what I thought Catholic colleges were like or Baptist you know, colleges and universities were like. I was in a totally secular institution. Mm -hmm. and, you know, resolutely modernist. And I mean, I could go on and on. It, as I said, you know, the kind of place where if you even mention core Texas, like, well, what kind of elitist are you? You know, you're going to bring us, you know, some more dead white man hegemony. Yeah, I recognize that, uh, no, no, that conversation. No. <laughs> what it is, please. Yeah. But, but it's very it's, good. Yeah. And, and I just learned so many things from, from people and about stuff like evolution too, you know, to talk to people to a man who has to, who had to teach, who is from, I think, British West Indies, and who had to teach in a, in Baylor University, and sweet little Baptist boys and girls, you know, who had never heard a good word about Darwin, he taught evolution. <laughs> and it was totally fascinating to talk to him about, you know, the kind of perspectives that you get. So, yeah, thanks again to all of you and also to our, um, ACTC technical uh, volunteering students. Yes, thank you. We, we know you're there.